Hey, good morning, everybody. Pastor Brian Doback here. So glad for you to join me. I'm just excited to share with you this next uh, part of Scripture. Uh, I, I hope you had a great week. Um, I trust that you did. Man, you know, today's text, um, it, it's basically like I thought of it like this. It's like opening a treasure chest, right, and, and being blinded by the shine of all the gold medallions, you know. Uh, today, this text is, is one of those uh, texts where we really get to see why uh, many people believe that Romans chapter 8 is the best chapter in the Bible. Uh, man, that's bold to say that. And, you know, in, in every text of this chapter, we're seeing that. We saw it last week um, and, and all the richness and, and the amazing truth uh, that we get. Uh, from God uh, through that text. And we're going to see it again today, no different. And we're really getting to see why this is uh, considered to be the best chapter in the Bible. You know, today we're going to talk about identity, about identity and how we continuously need to be reminded. We can never be reminded enough of who we are in Christ. And we're going to learn why. You know, and I, I, I've been thinking about it this way. You know, when getting directions to get somewhere, you need two reference points. Two reference points, right? You need a, one, the one reference point is where you're going, right? And then what's the other one? Where you currently are. That's that's how you get directions. That's how you make it to a place where you need to go. Where you're going and where you're starting. You can't find a place without knowing first where you're going. But then equally as important, equally as important is knowing where you're starting from. Listen, God is the goal, always the goal, right? This relationship with God and, and first getting to him, right? But then also growing in our relationship with God. And, and, and that's the goal. But listen, we don't, we, we don't get to him, right? We don't get to him. Jesus is the one who gets us to him, right? Jesus is the bridge, right? He, he gets us to God. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the path. Right. And, and Jesus. So he's always the goal. He's our landing point. Right. But we can't know how to get there until we know where we are. And in particular, in this case today, who we are. Right. In our relationship with God, we need to know our position, our position. Our position is the point of reference that we start from. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. That point of reference is who we are. It's our identity in Christ. Right. But we often get that point of reference wrong and it messes it all up. It discombobulates everything. Discombobulates is a great word, by the way. Use it today sometime in a conversation. <laughs> it discombobulates uh, everything in our lives when we get our identity wrong, this position, right, this position. So man, we're going to get into Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. So let's pray first and then we'll get into the text. Father, uh, God, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for technology and just the way that we're able to uh, continue to get your word out and your and your truth and your message. And uh, um, what an honor and a privilege to be able to share it uh, with people. And uh, God, I pray for all of our ears and uh, the, the ears, uh, our, our physical ears and then the ears of our hearts, Lord, that, that we, we, we really listen and uh, we take in your word and what you have to say. Father, and um, I thank you, and uh, man, secure us, Lord, um, in your word and in your truth, and uh, I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So the text in uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17, uh, we'll just start in 12 through 13 and talk a little bit about that, but it says this, the scripture says, so then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Right. So at the moment we believe the gospel, at the moment we believe the gospel, we receive the Holy Spirit. Right. The Holy Spirit. It's the literal spirit of God. Right. Dwells within us. He is the vehicle by which God resides in us. Right. And the spirit begins to wage its battle. There's this war that begins between the spirit and the flesh. Right. And, and, and the spirit, it resurrects uh, us. It resurrects our spiritual deadness. 
into new life, into holiness, resurrects us into spiritual vitality, right? And, and Christ-likeness, into the image of Christ. And just previous to this text, uh, in verse 11, Paul says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Right. So so then Paul says, so then, brothers. Right. So today Paul continues his thought and he's saying that we are debtors. We are debtors. Right. A debtor is somebody who owes money to somebody else. And uh, he's saying that we're not debtors to the flesh, but we're debtors to the spirit. We're debtors to God. Right. And, and, And the flesh. Listen, the flesh will make you think you owe it to yourself to gratify its desires. Right. And we see that in our culture today, you know, uh, in our culture today, our culture teaches us that that we're debtors to the flesh. We're debtors to our bodies. Right. To gratify them. However it is you feel, you know, live that out. Right. Gratify the desires of your body. You owe it to yourself. Right. You, you owe it. Uh, and, and if we but listen, Paul is saying if we and God is saying to us, if we live like we're debtors to the flesh, we're going to die. We're going to die. It will lead to a, a eternal death, right? But if we live like we're debtors to the Spirit, we will live. We will live. So to do this, Paul reminds us of, of what? Who we are in Christ. He reminds us of our identity and who we are in Christ because knowing this is significant. Knowing who we are is significant in understanding our position in relation to God. Right. So the scripture continues on in verses 14 to 17. It says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Right? And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You know, when you read Paul's New Testament letters, uh, there's this huge theme that you really can't miss. It's really hard to miss. And it's this theme of identity, identity. Almost, he's almost always taking readers to their identity. And, and, and just about every letter to a church that he writes in the New Testament, he's always taking readers to their identity and who they are in Jesus Christ. You know, we need to pay close attention when he does this. Pay very close attention. And Paul, he turns the attention of the church in Rome to their identity. And, and man, he says the all, all you know, they, they would have needed this because, listen, Rome was like the center of the world back then. It, it was a big city. I th- it may have been the biggest city. Um, it was the center of world of the world back then, and they were up against a lot. You know, the waves of the world and the culture and all of that were strong. They were strong. And, man, he, he gives them and us the, the, these amazing titles, right, these titles, sons of God, children of God, heirs of God, heirs with Christ. Paul is making light of their and our position. They're in our position. You know, I was thinking it's football season. It's imperative. It's imperative that we know our position in relation to God. It is. Man, and, but and you can't play effective football. Thinking about football, you can't play effective football if you don't know your position. You can't do it. If you don't know your position, each position carries with it different responsibilities and different movements and different routes, and it covers a certain area of the field. And, and listen, if you're on the field, you know, you've got the, your goal. If you're on offense, right, you've got the end zone as your goal. And if you're on the field, but you don't know your position or what your routes are or the, 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 the area of the field that you cover, 
you don't know what to do. How on earth is a team going to get there if nobody knows their position? And even if just one or two of them don't know their position. It, similarly, we can't live according to the Spirit without knowing our position in relation to God. And Paul, he reminds the church in Rome, this is who you are. This is your position. Start from here. Start from here. This is your position. We can't be reminded of this enough. We can't. We can't be reminded of this enough. We talked last week about how the world, how the world gives us our identity through, through different communities, if you remember that, right? And these communities, they tell us who we are. They tell us who we are, and we often listen because we're instinctually tribal, we talked about last week. To determine how to live and how to be saved and, and the things of God, we adopt the values and beliefs right, the, of the tribe that we most closely associate with. We adopt their values and beliefs. It could be your family. It could be a, a group of friends. Uh, it, it could be a group of like-minded or like-living people. Uh, it could be pop culture. It could be the media. All of these communities that we're surrounded by are trying to tell us who we are. They tell you who you are. And we're all being told who we are by somebody, and we often listen. We often listen, and this is dangerous and deadly. Right. But listen, we also go to the other extreme. Right. We also go to the other extreme. You decide who you are. Right. You decide who you are. The world tells you often you decide who you are uh, and you you be who you want to be. You figure that out. You search within yourself, within your own heart, who you are and you create your identity on your own for yourself. Man, that sounds great. That sounds great. But don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. It's not. It's deadly too. And we desperately need the third way. The third way is this. Is there a better person to tell us who we are than our creator? The one who created us? Is there a better person to tell us who we are than him, than our creator? I mean, in this way, guys, we need to swap our identity. We need to swap our identity. We need to swap our identity from our community or our self-given identity to our God-given identity. God is telling us, this is who you are. This is who you are. We need to listen to that. Man, we need to ground ourselves in our identity as God tells us, right? Our identity driven from the flesh, right? Is our identity is either going to be driven from the flesh or our identity is going to be driven by the Spirit. And this is what God is telling us through the Spirit, that is this here in this text. Let's take a look, a little closer look at what, who God says we are and the new identity we have been given in Christ. Man, he says, he says we are adopted, adopted sons and children of God. This, this spirit of adoption he's talking about, right? In Rome, in the time of Paul, uh, adoption usually occurred when a wealthy adult, right, had no heir for his estate. Uh, that's how adoption commonly was back then. It's a little bit different today, uh, but back then it was very, very commonly that when a wealthy adult had no heir for his estate and he would then adopt someone as their heir. It could have been a child, right? It could have been a youth. It could have been an adult. Uh, adults adopted adults for this purpose. And But the moment the adoption occurred, the moment it occurred, several things were immediately true, immediately true, of the new son or daughter. Uh, one, his old debts and his legal ob obligations were paid, right? Uh, a second one was he got a new name. He got a new name and he was instantly, instantly heir of, of, of all the father that had, right? A third one is his new father became instantly liable for all his actions, instantly liable for all of his actions going forward. Right. And even in the past, but also going forward, debts, crimes, all of that stuff, man. And then also uh, a fourth one was the new son also had new obligations uh, to honor and please 
the Father, right? Now, all of this lies behind this passage here. This, Paul is talking about this. All of this lies behind the passage here. God has adopted us as his own, as his very own in Christ. When we believe in the gospel, right? And, and, and our debt and our legal option, our legal obligations are paid for. They're paid for on the cross. On the cross, our debt and our legal obligations are paid for. Also, we get a new name. We get a new name, right? Listen, not literally. Like, I'm still Brian. I've been Brian since the day I was born, and I stayed Brian uh, when I believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and listen, I am a father. You know, there's all these other titles um, in my life. Uh, I, I'm still Brian. I, I am a father. I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm an uncle, right? But I am first and foremost... This is my identity. I am a child of God. I am an adopted son of God. I am a child of God, first and foremost. Man, that is at the top. That, that's my identity. My identity is not in anything else, in any of those other titles, right? Man, Jesus, and Jesus took on uh, our liability. He took on our liability for the debt of our sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. He took on the, our liability for the debt of our sins and the cosmic crime of our sin. God is our father. God is our father. And Paul, he uses this wording, Abba Father, Abba Father. You know, at face value, at face value, it may not seem like very much, but man, this, is, these, this wording is significant. It is significant in understanding our relationship with God. It, it, it was a common term that expressed uh, affection, confidence, uh, trust, and, and similar to how a father is, is daddy, right, is daddy uh, to his child. That, that term that he uses, Abba Father, carries with it that emphasis of daddy, of daddy. And man, I love when my kids call me dad or daddy. Um, you know, it really says a lot. I appreciate that so much. And uh, it, it signifies the close, intimate relationship of a father and his child, right? And the childlike trust that a, a young child puts in his daddy, right? Man, so, so through faith in the gospel, uh, God adopts us. God adopts us, and it's final, it is final, signed, sealed, and delivered. It's final. He's not giving us back. We are intimately his. You know, in our household, <laughs> in our household, whenever whenever we have a pet, um, and, and when it does like something bad, our, our family, like our family, is like maybe we should give him back. You know, <laughs> and, and our cat. Uh, our cat was under our bed recently, and uh, Sadie, our youngest daughter, uh, climbed under the bed. She was she was singing to the cat. She was singing to the cat, and the cat punched her in the mouth really bad. And um, her mouth was bleeding a little bit, and she was crying, and she was really impacted and scarred by it. And, uh, man, and But all she wanted to do was, let's give this cat back. We have to give this cat back, right? And she wanted to get rid of him. And listen, I'm, I'm like, I'm the person in our family that's like, no, no, we can't. That's not right. We can't give a, a pet back. Once you take that pet in, you are making a commitment to that pet. And, and you are saying that you're going to take care of this cat for the rest of, of its life, right? And there's no going back, right? And uh, I'm not going to lie to you. We have given back one pet, <laughs> We gave back one pet. It did something bad, and we just felt like we had to. But the point is, God isn't like that. God isn't like that. He has adopted us, and it's final. He's not giving us back. He's not. And listen, there's freedom in that. Is there not? Is there not freedom in that, that he is so with us? He is so committed to us? He's not giving us back, right? There's freedom in that. And yet, yet we live as if God is a boss, we live as if God is a boss whose pleasure rides on whether or not we perform, right? But the freedom we have, right, the freedom we have in knowing that he's not giving us back, right? We are adopted children of God gives us new motivations. It gives us new motivations, man. Instead of having to serve God, right, or 
having to obey him. We want to serve God. We want to serve our Heavenly Father, our Abba Father. We want to obey our Abba Father, right? Our Daddy, right? Our Heavenly Daddy. Man, we want to listen to somebody that we love, right? Somebody that we intimately love, right? Yeah, we, uh, we have new desires. We have new desires to please and honor God, and most importantly, with different motivations, love and gratitude. Our motivation becomes love and gratitude, not fear, not fear, right? Paul says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, right? Fear before was the number one motivation, right? And trying to obey God's law as a way of acceptance with him. That was our number one motivation. It's an impossible dream. It's an impossible dream to do that. And when you try, you're only going to recycle guilt and shame. Paul is saying, don't go back to that way of life. Don't go back to that way of life. It is self-defeating. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. For those who are in Christ Jesus, no condemnation at all, ever. Knowing this position in relation to God allows us to live according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. He also says, we are heirs. We are heirs of God, heirs with Christ. Man, so, so as I previously stated, as adopted sons and daughters of God, we also become heirs. And an heir, right, an heir is illegally entitled, is legally entitled to the property or rank of another. You're inheriting something, right? And I think I've told you before, I think I've told you before that my parents are, are relatively wealthy. Um, and, and they've told me that I have, a, I have a, you know, an inheritance waiting for me. I have an inheritance waiting for me after they die. Now, listen, we don't live, we don't live life or make decisions in light of that, right? Uh, but on the contrary, we actually live as if it's not coming, as if it's not coming, because anything can happen. Anything can happen. We're not guaranteed that, right? Anything can happen. It can be lost. We're not guaranteed it. But my point is twofold. Listen, I'd be lying to you if I said that there wasn't some sense of freedom some sense of freedom that comes with the knowledge of an inheritance. There's some sense of freedom that comes along with that. And, and, and also, uh, my, my other point is that my eternal inheritance is what really matters, and that's where my focus should be, right? My focus needs to be on who I am in Christ, and in this case, as an heir of God and, and with Christ, setting my mind on God's complete, unconditional acceptance of me in Christ. And, and it's, it's freeing. It's freeing when I remember that I have an eternal inheritance coming uh, for me in the future. And, and listen, and it says we inherit God himself, himself, and we are heirs with Christ, right? Eternity, eternity is going to be tangibly amazing. It's going to be tangibly amazing, right? And man, we could go through a whole sermon about that and a sermon series about what eternity is going to be like. Um, but it's really God. It's really God that's going to make eternity amazing, right? It's God. We're heirs of God. <laughs> We're heirs of God. It's really him. He's our gift. He's our first and foremost. He is our inheritance, right? And then it says, and then it says we are heirs with Christ, Right? What Christ has inherited as his reward for his life of perfect obedience and the cross, we too will share in that inheritance. Man, that's incredible. Man, that, that should be freeing. That should give us a sense of free, freedom to know that that is coming. That acceptance and that commitment right, from God gives us a freeing feeling that we need to live according to the, to the Spirit to live according to the spirit and not to the flesh. Knowing this position, this position in relation to God allows us to live according to the spirit of adoption, right? And not the spirit, as the text says, the spirit of slavery. Man, when, when, when we do this, right? When we know our position, man, so it, it, it affects us from our, uh, for our identity in Christ. It, it affects us, right? So we don't listen to what a community tells us about who we are, but neither do we allow, neither do we allow ourselves to, to determine it. We allow God to tell us who we are. And when we do or we don't, 
when we do or we don't, it's deeply effectual, right? It tangibly affects our lives. And I want to talk quickly about four ways it affects our lives. And, and it's security, security, intimacy, assurance, and purpose, particularly purpose and suffering. Security, intimacy, assurance, and purpose, purpose and suffering. So I want to compare the spirit of slavery and the spirit of adoption, okay? using these four effects uh and and in this we're going to talk about the spirit of slavery first right and the spirit of slavery for security right under the spirit of slavery we have none we have no security we have no security because we feel like we have to obey because it all depends on me right it all depends on me. We have no security, and we obey under compulsion. We obey uh, like we have to. Oh, I have to do this, right? Man, and, and what about under the spirit of adoption? Under the spirit of adoption, man, we are secure. We are secure because of the cross. We obey out of love and out of gratitude. We are secure because of the cross. It's not I have to obey. It's I want to obey, right? I want to obey, man. And, uh, and, and so the second one, intimacy, right? Let's talk about intimacy under the spirit of slavery, right? This, this, what we see here in this text, intimacy, right? Uh, under the spirit of slavery, we have none. We have no intimacy. We have no intimacy with God, right? We, we keep our distance from God because we're afraid, we have that fear. We're afraid, right? And we, we really only concentrate on external behaviors and compliance, right? External behaviors and compliance. But under the spirit of adoption, in the spirit of adoption for intimacy, we have joy. We have joy in daddy. Joy in daddy. And our concentration is, is on relationship. It's on relationship, it's on attitudes, and it's, it's in, in the motivations behind compliance, right? And then that third one, assurance. Assurance, man, we, we all deeply are in need of assurance. We want assurances in our lives, right? And uh, under the spirit of slavery, we have none. We have no assurance. We have no assurances, right? Because salvation and life depend on, depends on me, right? So... And, but we mess up every day. We're up and we're down and, and, and we're, we're, just, we're just a total wreck, right? How can we be assured of, 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 of God's commitment to me when it depends on me, right? How can we, we don't get that assurance, right? And we're constantly frustrated. We're constantly frustrated because peace eludes us. Peace eludes us. But under the spirit of adoption, under the spirit of adoption, we have full assurance, full assurance, right? Because salvation in life depends on the work of another, not me, but on the work of another, and that's Jesus. That's Jesus, right? And we get that sense of peace and that sense of joy, right? And then the finally, the fourth one, right? Purpose, purpose and suffering, right? Because there in verse 17, we, he talks a little bit about suffering, purpose and suffering under the spirit of slavery we have none we have no purpose we have none no purpose right we forget that jesus bore the punishment for our sins right we forget that if we even know it right we we forget that so suffering under the spirit of slavery suffering is retribution it's punishment it's retribution it's payback from god that's what, that's, that's what the purpose of suffering is. Under the spirit of adoption, under the spirit of adoption, right, we remember. We remember because Jesus bore the punishment for my sins, suffering is not retribution. It's not, retribu <laughs> it's not retribution. Man, it's not payback from God, right? It's not those things. It's not punishment. It's loving instruction and it's loving discipline. That's what suffering is. So under, under the spirit of slavery, we will constantly compare ourselves to how others right, are living and, and how they're obeying God. We'll look at other Christians right, and compare ourselves. And comparison is killer. It absolutely kills us. We seek approval and acceptance through our own performance or we seek it from the affections of others and not God. Right? 
uh, and, and we demand way too much from people in the world and, and, and then they can actually give us, then they can offer us, right? We're harsh on others, we're cold, we're judgmental. Under the spirit of slavery, we're quick to point out other people's faults, right? Under the spirit of slavery, we'll be over-dependent on things and people for a sense of security, for that sense of intimacy and that sense of assurance. We'll be over-dependent on ourselves and others. Man, but under the spirit of adoption, we've got security in Christ. We've got intimacy in Christ through our Abba Father, right? Assurance, and we've got purpose in suffering. So I want to conclude on this. We mustn't derive our identity from a particular community or ourselves. No, those two extremes, right? But from who God says that we are. In Christ, in Christ, our position in relationship to God, in relation to God, is Abba Father. Abba Father, Daddy. He is our Heavenly Daddy. Right? We are adopted children of God, heirs of God and heirs with Christ. And the security and the intimacy and the assurance and the purpose were all won for us on the cross. All Jesus. Jesus is our landing spot. Man, Jesus is our landing spot. And our identity in Christ as adopted children of God, that's our starting point. That is our starting point. Knowing our identity and our position in relation to God will impact, will impact will have an impact on how we relate with others. Our decisions that we make, the choices that we make, all the practical aspects of our lives. Man, so I want to ask you, are you living under the spirit of adoption or the spirit of slavery? And if so, I want to call you, I want to challenge you, and I want to, I want to ask you, to make that decision and make that choice. If you haven't put your faith and trust in Christ, in, in the gospel, in what he has done on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, I want to challenge you to do that right now. Right now. And listen, if you're a Christian, if you're, if you're a Christian right now and you're struggling, you know, uh, you're struggling with these things that we've talked about, whether it's security or intimacy or assurance or this purpose and suffering, man, I want to call you to take a stand to take a stand and remember who you are in Christ. Meditate on that. Believe on that. Remember what the gospel means. Go back to the gospel because all of our answers are at the cross. All of them are at the cross. Let's pray. Father, God, I thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you for oh, what you've done for us, Lord. You have given us this new identity, Lord, this, uh, this swap. Father, help us to swap our identities from whatever the uh, community is telling us or whatever we're telling ourselves, Lord, and, and man, propel us and move us to listen to you and you alone. It's your words and nobody else's words that truly matter, Father. Help us to live in that identity. Help us to to, to just bathe in it, Lord, to swim in that identity and, and just um, enjoy that the freedom and the peace of, of knowing that we're adopted sons and children of God, that we are heirs of, of you and heirs with Christ, Lord. Father, I, I thank you for uh, this identity that you give us, Lord. And none of us are, are, are completely knocking this out of the park. We're not hitting grand slams, Lord. We can always grow in our understanding and of our identity, Lord. Help us grow in that. Help us in this battle, this war between the spirit and the flesh. And help us to remember these truths that we've learned so far. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who are in Christ Jesus. None none. There is none. Ah, and let that free us, Lord. And, and, then, and then, Father, help us to remember our identity in Christ, our position, this starting place, Lord, so we can land where we want to land, Lord. And that's with you, 
our, our heavenly daddy, Father, our Abba Father. Thank you. And I pray for, uh, for our, our weeks forward and that you would uh, empower us to live for you, Father. And I thank you and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so grateful that you took some time out uh, to do that. Uh, I certainly hope to see you again soon. Uh, we love you. And if, as always, if you need anything, uh, please uh, reach out to us. Reach out to me. You know how to do that. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend. Take care. We love you. Peace.